you know, having a day job, even a half-time day job, does take some of the pressure off trying to, you know, finish a book when you don't quite know how the book ends. You know, I don't feel like I have to do that now that I have a day job. Yay! On the other hand, I really should finish this book. <laughs> the, the royalty track doesn't pull up uh, every six months and just beep, 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 and we <laughs> dump the money. <laughs> so, yeah, um... It's, it takes some pressure off and it gets me out of my head a little bit. And, you know, and I finish an article every couple of weeks, whereas I, you know, so you get a little gold star from the universe. It's like, well done, you, you accomplished a thing. Um, whereas if you're relying on that for novels, they don't come very often. So it's nice to have deadlines that are more than once every 18 months. And it's nice to have colleagues and it's nice to get out of the house. So I do, I, I enjoy my day job. I, what I wish is that there were like 10 days in the week. You know, if I could write for three days, I go to perimeter for three days and then I write for three days and then I have two days on the weekend. What does that make? Eight. I'm bad at this. You know, I could, I could write for five days and then have two days on the weekend. That sounds perfect. That sounds fabulous. I would love that. But sadly, no one put me in charge of time. So. Well, not yet. Nice. <laughs> but keep going. We'll, we'll see how it shakes out. <laughs> All right. One of the things we're going to change about time is this time around, uh, we're not going to let the morning people set the social schedule just because they got there first. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to stay up to like two, three in the morning, and then we're going to set the social schedule. And it's going to say you need to be productive until like two, three in the morning, and then you can sleep as long as you want. And all the morning people are going to be, my body doesn't work that way. And we'll be like, too bad. So... <laughs> I assume that's one of the secret things that's happening at CERN uh, is that they're, they're working on that. Sooner or later, we're going to have the mist uh, come out and cover the, the world and the monsters. <laughs> and like, that's where it started. Really like. <laughs> CERN is like a trailer park of science. There is really? nothing glamorous at CERN. It is just, it's a hodgepodge of, you know, you know those buildings on your university campus that are like built of cinder block and barely finished on the inside? All right, so about like 50 of those sprinkled on a field in France, you know, and with a big fence around it for unknown reasons. Well, partly because an international border runs down the middle of it. But, um, yeah, it's... I assume they keep out the terrorists that want to unleash the mist. <laughs> probably, probably. And the people who want to try the skydiving from uh, the Divin with one of the Rob David Brown books had people skydiving and antimatter at CERN. And I'm like, I spent a lot of time at CERN and I'm fairly sure there was no skydiving facility, but okay. <laughs> no, it's just, I mean, it's, it's graduate students and postdocs and, you know, people from all over the world spending seven months away from their family, you know, and drinking terrible cheap Swiss beer. And we do have a very nice, there was a very nice croquet lawn on which international croquet tournaments were occasionally played. I, I don't know the rules of croquet. I spent a long time trying to deduce the rules of croquet and didn't succeed. But that was probably the most glamorous part of CERN when I was there. I have this, uh, I have had so many uh, theories about how writing might work. That's, that's what I like to do. I do some research, but then I also like to tell myself little stories about how maybe the world's this way. Let's not verify yeah. it. Let's assume that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I talked with um, uh, Susan K. Quinn, who's a wonderful author who uh, is a former rocket scientist with NASA. <laughs> uh, I talked with uh, Dr. Pat Babuka Trauman, uh, who is a former top uh, oceanographer and, and, and current uh, professor and, and, and scientist and, and some other scientists along the way. It's, this is episode, I don't know, 58, 59, somewhere in there. We've done a lot of shows, lots of great guests. Go check them out, esteemed audience. Listen to them all. They're amazing. But when I'm talking with these uh, women uh, who have this in, in, uh, background in science, I mean, that's not easy stuff. That's not uh, sleep in late, come in, have my shirt half untucked the way I used to do when I was uh, managing a subway on the weekends. This is, <laughs> this is serious stuff. Does that discipline you think that you've developed? Uh, just I've noticed this trend that uh, these, these science, uh, brilliant scientific minds are now writing brilliant books and having a great deal of success. And I'm wondering 
if there isn't some overlap where that training of both your mind uh, and and your your work ethic um, translates over to your writing career uh, and and provides some sort of benefit that way. Maybe. Um, I mean, I had this gap in the middle where I was definitely of the shirt untucked brigade. Um, and then I wrote a bunch of poetry. So, I don't know, it's hard for me to think of it in terms of work ethic. But I tell you what the real connection is between, uh, for me, between science and writing. It's, it's the ability to bash your head against something for a really long time uh, until you uncover something interesting about it. Um, for example, let me grab a clip tissue here. Like when I was a kid, I really, I was really interested in science. I wanted to be a physicist. I did not understand what that meant. Um, still don't to a certain extent. And I remember asking my like fifth grade science teacher or something, my fifth grade teacher wouldn't have been a science teacher. Like why does a ball roll down a hill? Why is it's got potential energy when it's at the top of the hill? It's got kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. What makes the kinetic energy better than the potential energy? Why does it like always roll down, right? And she's like, well, sweetie, that would be the gravity. <laughs> uh, and I remember making little charts of this because I understood that that's what scientists do is like they make charts and put them on cork boards and take them to science fairs, right? So I made little <laughs> charts about this and put them on cork boards and took them to science fairs and people were like, well, sweetie, that would be the gravity. Did you like build a robot or something or a you know volcano out of out of baking soda? I'm like, no, I'm really interested in this ball thing. Okay. So I went to high school and I had a really excellent science teacher. She was fabulous. And I remember asking her, you know, why does this ball roll down the hill? What's the difference between the potential energy and the kinetic energy? And she's like, well, that's entropy. We're really not gonna cover it in high school science, but you know, here's a book you could go look up and, you know, this, these are the laws of entropy and these are the laws of thermodynamics and this is how the universe works is, you know, this potential energy turns into, turns into motion and then the motion turns into disorganization and that's how that works. And you're like, okay. So you get to um, university and they're like, okay, entropy, here's how entropy works. And you take a whole... Um, you know, a whole class on thermodynamics or at least half a term on thermodynamics and you learn the laws of entropy and you get some, you know, some grasp on how that works and statistical mechanics and all this stuff. And you figure you've, you've pretty much got the ball nailed. And then you get to graduate school and you ask, okay, the ball rolls down the hill with the entropy. And they're like, well, yes, but entropy contains an arrow of time. And almost nothing else in physics contains an arrow of time. Almost nothing else in physics contains a preference for whether the film is running forward or backwards. Um, very little. In fact, it may all be an illusion. We're not sure that it's real at all, time, as we experience it. And I'm like, wait, what? I was done. I was good with the entropy. They're like, yes, but, you know, and then you get these, you know, you get really off the deep end of theory, and that's where you start finding things that are new. Just by bashing your head against this simple question for years at a time. You know, so I think learning to bash your head against a simple question until you find the thing about it that's really kept you going on it is an excellent school skill for writers to have. Being in always a little bit over your head you know, and trying to do something impossible. It's an excellent skill for writers to have. <laughs> you know, um, the people I work with now at Perimeter, you know, they're trying to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. It's one of the many things that they're trying to do, but many of the people in the building are trying to do that. The best minds in the world have been trying to do that for 80 some years, 80 years. Three scientific generations at least. And at this point, we have two decent guesses, and that's it. And does that excite you that this could be the eventually the one, and then 80 years of stalemate? You're welcome, <laughs> Aaron Bow, award-winning oh. author, out. Or uh, <laughs> does it fill you with a sense of despair? 80 years, obviously, this isn't something that's going to happen. What are we doing here? No, I think, you know, there's a, there's a feeling of, like, community and continuum about it, you know? 
that you have to be willing to bash your head against something impossible so that you can do some tiny piece of it. Um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that anybody in the building is going to go, oh, here we go. This is how string theory works, and this is exactly how it predicts everything about the universe, and here is our unification of quantum mechanics and gravity. This is perfect. I mean, is this going to happen? No. We're going to get a little piece here and a little piece there and a little bit and a little thing. And, you know, there's always a possibility that we'll have a new Einstein who will just have a new story to tell. But most of us are, you know, writing a novel that talks to other novels that are, you know, writing, you know, one little piece of the story. I keep writing about ghosts. Uh, I've finally written a comedy, but it's set in a funeral home. <laughs> so I keep writing this, you know, what do we do about death story. Am I going to come up with an answer for what we do about death and the fact that we're mortal? Probably not. But can I continue that conversation? Sure. And might I come up with some tiny piece of it that's new or that helps other people think or move forward in theirs? I think that's possible. I think that's really possible. So, you know, I think that's the connection is, you know, being part of a community and trying something that's just totally impossible and trying to move it forward just inch by inch by inch.